Please welcome Terry Crews. <laughs> I've been waiting to get you on the show for so long. This is so exciting. First things first. Yes. Congratulations, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Woo! Back on the air. In the wildest twist, tell me the truth. Did you take your shirt off and, and like, convince someone to do it? Did you, like, go in, like, I'm gonna break somebody? Uh, this, it, yeah, it was a little, lot of threats. No, no. <laughs> I, I, let me tell you, when I found out, because you gotta understand, every show is, like, its own personality, its own human being. Right. And, you know, I was I was literally doing another show, and then five minutes before I was about to go on, I get a, a, a email saying the show is canceled. Now you gotta understand, that's like your favorite uncle has just died right, right. now, and you're like, what? What? So I go on, I'm going, oh my god, what do I do? Hi everyone, and then uh, literally the whole day goes by. We are depressed, we're mourning, the whole deal, and the internet goes nuts. Everyone I know, Mark right. Hamill, right. Guillermo del Toro, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda goes nuts on the internet and they want the show back. Right. But all of a sudden, we're trying to figure out where we're going to go. And, you know, Hulu passed and Netflix passed. And all of a sudden, NBC picks us up 30 hours later. Wait, we're not talking that, days. That is... We're talking minutes and hours right now. So your uncle came back from the dead 30 yes. hours later. He walked back in through the door, front door, and I was like, ah! I put my <laughs> legs up on him. That is such a wild... <laughs> you, 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 you have to say, I mean, like, it, it, it shows you two things. One, how beloved the show is, because Brooklyn Nine-Nine is amazing. It's one of the funniest shows Thank on TV. You. Thank you. you are one of the funniest people on TV, and then that news is happening, and at the same time, people trying to absorb the fact that you are in Deadpool 2, which was a surprise to me. I didn't know this. Your family didn't know this. Is no, this true? No. First of all, it was the biggest secret. Like, if I would have told anybody that I was in it, they would have owned my kids. That's the issue. Uh, <laughs> it's like Marvel is about secrecy. It's like CIA, FBI. Secrecy and owning kids. That's uh, a weird no, business. No, yeah, I'm trying to tell you, dude. It's really, <laughs> really... Because everything right. is right. These fanboys do not play. Right. I was literally walking to set in my, in my whole costume in a blanket hiding from paparazzi, from fanboys. They want any bit of information. And we had to keep this thing. It was under lock so, and key. So what do you tell your family then? So are you just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy some milk? Uh, I, I, <laughs> well, what do you listen, say? No, you know, I walked away like Bruce Banner into the forest. And I was like, <laughs> I'll be back. And all of a sudden, I come back out. I'm a little dirtier, a little tired. I'm like, I did it. <laughs> I got it. You know, I just imagine no your daughter, and she's like, I think he, she, I think he killed another one. I think he, <laughs> he's killing people in the forest. But it's, it's, it's a huge movie. Deadpool, Pool, yes. I mean, and what, what's great about it is it breaks the format, you know, there's, there's a whole different thing. How have you enjoyed it? Like, did you ever think that you'd be able to create this world where you are in many ways a superhero? We know you from Expendables, we know you from all these action movies, but you are also simultaneously one of the funniest human beings out there. When did that become a thing for you? You know what? It, it, it's, it happens when you do your own thing. You know what I mean? And when you are creative. I'm a big, big fan of... Like, I hate competition. I could Because for me, competition is the exact opposite of creativity. Like, right. I'm the only guy who can go from Sesame Street to a Kendrick Lamar video all the way over to Brooklyn Nine-Nine on the same day. Right. You know what I mean? And because it's well, you, on me... You and Elmo, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. <laughs> Almost hardcore. Yeah, that's very true. Very, very, <laughs> he's gangster. Almost he's gangster. gangster. Almost gangster. Okay. Uh, but, but the thing is, is by being me... Right. ...and being the best me possible, because that's what I discovered. Because when you first get in town, you're trying to be like, they want you to be the next this or the right, next right, that. Right. And I was, I was like, you know what? I just want to do what I do. And what was happening is they noticed that. And it was it, right now, it's been the key to my career. If you, if you said to me, what is one thing that I think of when I think of Terry Crews, that would be mold breaker. Because that's, that's what you do. You break the mold of pe what people expect. Not only are you someone who played in the NFL, but is an accomplished artist and you design furniture. Yes. You are somebody who loves the funny side. You love the sensitive side. Your name became synonymous with the Me Too movement yes. when you were one of the first men who came out and said, hey, let me tell you about a side of toxic masculinity. Let me tell you a, about a side of sexual harassment that involves men. Right. And a lot of women gravitated to that because they went like, thank you for exposing how pervasive this is in Hollywood. Yes. And there were a lot of men who said, I, like, I can't believe this would happen to Terry Crews and I can't believe Terry Crews would talk about that. Why was it so important for you to share something that many people would see 
as a weakness. Well, the, the thing is, you know what? Women have been talking about this for thousands of years. Like, help us, help us. And what happens is, you, you know, men have turned off. It's one of those things where, you know, they, they totally have stopped listening. They've heard it so much, they're just like, whatever. And what I discovered was, you know, when my story broke, it allowed people to see their own, like the, the times they, their lines got stepped on. Right, you understand right, what I mean? Right, because right. this is the thing, you get tricked into thinking it's part of the job. You know what I mean? Right. Somebody really crosses the line, you know, and it's really weird because when I look at like things like fraternity hazing, what they are a lot of times is sexual assault masked as something else. And it's wild because it's about power. It's never about, you know, sex or anything right. like that. It's about someone trying to dominate you and take over you or, or show off. And the fact, what happened to me was this guy was literally trying to show me he had my genitals in his hands, so right. to speak. And I'm sitting here, and, but he's also supposed to be the person who protects me. Right. He was my agent. And what's so crazy is that, you know, success is the warmest place to hide. And everyone feels like, my God, you know, how could he be this? He's, he's so successful. He's all that. It, it's so, you know, counterproductive. And, but it, it's not. The thing is, successful people know that they can get away with this. That makes it, that's actually one of the things that really is a qualifier for sexual assault. Because if a, a police officer rapes you, who are you going to tell? That's the issue. And for me, it was like my agent, I, he's like, I, I know you're not going to tell anybody. And you know what? He got the surprise of his life when he found out I was telling everybody. And I told them, and I'm telling the world. And I'm telling you, it's done. This is over, man. It's ridiculous. It's over on so many levels. You are, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, you, you, you know what I think is also beautiful about it is, I think on many, in many conversations, men need to speak more about toxic masculinity, the idea of what it means to be a man, the idea of understanding that manhood is not what it has been defined as for such a long time. Right. And having somebody like you, Terry Crews, the mold breaker, where you think you know what a man is and you go like, oh, but that is what a man is, is so important. You wrote a book in 2014. That's right. And at the time, people thought it was gonna just be a celebrity book. Oh, this is me, Terry Crews, living my life, doing my thing. You wrote about t toxic masculinity. Publishers were shocked and they said, Terry, this is not the book we expected from you. Yes. This was before the Me Too movement. This was before this became a big conversation. It has always been important to you. If there's one lesson you would like to teach young men, if there's a lesson you wish men could learn from you, what is the one thing you wish all men would understand about toxic masculinity? Well, my thing is, you know what? Um, it's impossible to love someone and control them at the same time. And what happens is you've been taught, like men have this thing where if you, you must control your world, you control these things, and, and to be a man, you must have control. But you can't control other people. That's the issue. And people get it mixed up. Right. And people are trying to control others. And, you know, you know it, it's so wild because, you know, you telling everyone what to do does not make you the boss. You doing everything you told yourself to do makes you the boss. And if you understand, and this is something I, I was a car-carrying member of the toxic masculinity group. Right. I, I was my way or the highway. I had my family under my fist. It was control. It was this and that. If you don't like it, it's my way. You can get out of here. And all of a sudden, everyone in my life was like, I don't want to be around you. You know what I mean? I was the Marlboro man, going off alone. Right. And I realized, I don't want to be alone. I don't want this. This is not what I want. And I was like, something, I've been tricked into thinking these things were part of manhood. And it's part, it's actually when masculinity turns into a cult and you, you don't accept, you know, you don't look like the things that ma modern masculinity right. wants from you, you're shunned. You're instantly shunned. It's funny because even now, I'm like, man, you know, Terry Crews is not a real man because he's, he's, he's showing deference to women and all this. I'm going, wait a minute. First of all, if we're all not equal, nobody is equal. That's the issue. Wow. That's the thing. If you don't lift, if you don't lift up those that need help, you never get help. And I, I, I discovered it. I put the book out in 2014, and it absolutely feels amazing to be validated right now. You, you have powerful words, and you received the Voice of Courage Award just last night at the Safe Horizon Champion Awards. And what really touched me about your remarks was you spoke about growing up in a home of domestic abuse. That's right. This is something I. You know, I relate to, I grew up in a home of domestic abuse as well. I think a lot of men are afraid to talk about what effect that has on them as a human being and a, as a man. Yeah. 
understanding you have to break that cycle, understanding the psychological effects it has on you. When you spoke about what it was like experiencing domestic abuse, seeing your mom in that situation, that must have been a painful experience to share. Yeah. But I'm assuming it was also cathartic. Oh, yeah. Has it changed the way you've lived with your family, understanding what your past has entailed? Oh, definitely. In fact, my daughter, Azriel, presented me with the award because, you know, it, it's wild because I look back, I remember... I remember looking at videos and I was yelling at her as if she was a 30-year-old man. And, I, and she was just this little baby girl. And now she's 27, she lives here in New York. And I remember I was just in tears, like, that was me. How could I do this to her? Like, because I, now I've grown, I've seen it. But you gotta understand, it's weird because you all, everyone needs wake-up calls, you know? There's things that you always think are right. Like, when I was a kid, we used to ride in the back of uh, uh, pickup trucks at 70 miles an hour on the freeway, and we wave at the cops, and the cops would honk back, hey, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and he's like, hey, how you doing? And then they started pulling kids out of trees. Right. Then they started pulling kids' body parts off the freeway. And they were like, you know, maybe, we, maybe they should buckle up. Right, right, Maybe right. they should be in the car buckled up. Right. This is how we are. This is what I realized. Like, things that I thought were cool were really toxic. And I had accepted these wrong things. And I looked at that video and then, and, 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 I, and I was just in tears. And I always, I come back to my kids and I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But to have her present me with that, I'm telling you, I was... I, I was like, I'm, I'm making amends. We're, we can fix this thing. This thing is fixable, everybody. I'm trying, it's good news. Because, what, 20 years ago, we could never talk about this stuff, right. ever. And I said, if I, I want to be the guy that brings this stuff up and makes it comfortable to talk about, because once you have the conversation, now we can change. Now everything can change. And I feel really, really good. My son is growing up in a different world than I grew up in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Blue 2 is in theaters May 18th. The season finale of Brooklyn Line 9 as May 20th on Fox. Terry Crews, everybody.